Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulillah wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa man wa la. Welcome everybody to the Safina Society, nothing but facts, live stream, filming out of the third story of the La Cucina Soup Kitchen, which is, today is Wednesday of course, and there are we are feeding one meal a week with the goal of by 2030, seven meals a week, and that's going to be all by Awqaf. And we're doing endowments. We're building out the basement of the of the uh, soup kitchen into an apartment. It's a basement with a little window and an exit door and everything, legal egress and all that jazz. And we're going to make that an apartment for the students of knowledge to live in and to take care of and to help with the soup kitchen. But it also be a revenue producing operation that will, inshallah, help us to reach our goals. We have goals with Dar al-Fatih. We have goals with La Cucina. We have goals with Omra for Youth. And the best way to use donations is to build assets. And this is the first asset we're going to have. Uh, completely cleaned out the entire basement, redid all the plumbing, redid the whole ceiling and walls and lighting and tore down a whole bunch of walls. And it's going to be now a beautiful state-of-the-art apartment for about six guys maybe what do you think six guys four guys i haven't seen it with the walls turned down okay four or five six guys it's gonna have a, a multi-purpose room like a chill room with a tv couch a desk for people to study on ryan doesn't like the tv or what oh he's talking about the stream okay ryan is here next to me and he's he's coaching the 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 rookie Zabe. Zabe, by the way, this is Zabe's debut. This is his second day uh, that he's led it by himself. So in any event, because uh, Omar's of course is in Syria, so we're gonna have that multi-purpose room with like a TV, a couch, a chill room, right? And that'll also be the place of salah. Then there's gonna be state-of-the-art kitchen with like a beautiful like counter and everything, right? <laughs> Uh, not that that's like unique for a kitchen. Everyone's got a counter, but it's going to be like a really nice, because we, 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 we got somebody who's a very good interior designer. All the latest looks, right? Then there's going to be an Arab sitting area, Turkish area sitting area where, with these seats like these. That's going to be the maximized space, to maximize space. We'll have that. Then on the other side, we're all the, they're almost like lockers. They're not like locker, lockers, but they're like lockers where, People could put all their clothes and everything. It'd be on the opposite side. So, and then uh, the sleeping area. So it's going to be, that's the best way to use fundraised money is to build an asset that will produce more money, right? Is you give somebody, you tell somebody, listen, um, uh, donate to this cause. And they're, okay, great. What are you doing with the money? We're, uh, no, we're just spending it right away. It doesn't inspire a person exactly. But if you say, listen, we're actually going to build out an asset that will allow us to earn revenue doing very little. All we have to do now at this point is monitor uh, the tenants and then, uh, which is some work, but not a lot of work, right? Monitor the tenants. We're going to send our own cleaning people there. I don't trust these Shabab. Most pious Shabab in the world. Doesn't make a difference. Slops. That's the reality. I mean, I was one of them, right? <laughs> Complete slops. So we're going to actually send in the cleaning lady ourselves. We're going to send in a cleaning man, like in a hazmat suit, right? Clean it all out, okay? And make sure this place is, is topped up with paper towels, toilet paper, and he cleans it out once a week, every Monday morning, right, to clean this place out. Monday morning, pretty much people are out and about. They leave. So while the place is empty, comes in, cleans it from top to bottom. So that let's say we have three tenants and we need two more. Well, the two more can't, we can't show them the place and it's looking like a trash. And if you want people to be clean, clean the place yourself because they're going to see it like, oh, it's clean. So one little piece of paper looks out of place. Mm. Whereas if it's not clean, right, uh, throw in an extra piece of paper doesn't make you feel anything. So that's the idea here. That's where we want to go. Let's begin today's program with the Dua of Wednesday. That's number one. Numero dos. As the title suggests, Omar, our own Omar Abbasi, is in Syria. The GRT, the borders have been closed for Gaza. So what have has GRT done? 
they flew Omar out. And he's helping them distribute zakah, food, all sorts of other things in Turkey and Syria. When he first said, told me and Ryan, I'm going to Turkey and Syria. I said, no, no, you, you, it's, it's like a death wish, right? Then I realized he's going with GRT. So he's going with an official operation yeah. that, um, you know, they, they know their ways and they have their connections there. Still going to give him trouble coming back. Though. Probably, I'm sure. And he's Syria on your passport. But by the way, is this Syria? You're going to see the pictures. Is it Syria or is it just like rubble? Mm. These aren't countries anymore. So They're not countries. I'm telling you, you're going to see pictures. You might cry when you see how the kids are playing. SubhanAllah. All right, let's get to draw. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. No, I don't know. بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم إنا فتحنا لك فتحا مبينا ليغفر لك الله ما تقدم من ذنبك وما تأخر ويتم نعمته عليك ويهديك صراطا مستقيما وينصرك الله نصرا عزيزا وكان عند الله وجيها وجيها في الدنيا والآخرة ومن المقربين وجهد وجهيا للذي فطر السماوات والأرض بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم نصر من الله وفتح قريب وبشر المؤمنين يا أيها الذين آمنوا كونوا أنصار كونوا أنصار الله كما قال عيسى بن مريم للحواريين من أنصاري إلى الله قال الحواريون نحن أنصار الله الله لا إله إلا هو الحي القيوم لا تأخذه سنة ولا نوم له ما في السماوات وما في الأرض من ذا الذي يشفع عنده عنده إلا بإذنه يعلم ما بين أيديهم وما خلفهم ولا يحيطون بشيء من علمه إلا بما شاء وسع كرسيه السماوات والأرض ولا يؤذه حفظهما وهو العلي العظيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم لو أنزلنا هذا القرآن على جبل لرأيته خاشعا متصدعا من خشية الله وتنك الأمثال نضربها للناس لعلهم يتفكرون هو الله والله الذي لا إله إلا هو عالم الغيب والشهادة هو الرحمن الرحيم والله الذي لا إله إلا هو الملك القدوس السلام المؤمن المهيمن العزيز الجبار المتكبر سبحان الله عما يشركون هو الله الخالق البارئ المسور له الأسماء الحسنى يسبح له ما في السماوات والأرض وهو العزيز الحكيم أعيذ نفسي بالله تعالى من كل ما يسمع بأذنين ويبصر بعين ويمشي برجلين ويبطيش بيدين ويتكلم بشفتين حسن نفسي بالله الخادم كن أكبر من شر ما أخاف وأحضر من الجن والإنس وأي يحضرون عز جاره وجنة ثناؤه وتقدست أسماؤه ولا إلى غيره الله من يجعلك في نحر أعدائي وأعوذ بك من شرورهم وتهيلهم ومكرهم ومكائدهم أطف نار من أراد أراد بي عداوة من الجن والإنس يا حافظ يا حفيظ يا كافي يا محيط سبحان سبحانك يا رب معظم شأنك وعز سلطانك تحسنت بالله وبأسماء الله وبآيات الله وملائكة الله وأنبياء الله ورسل الله والصالحين من عباد الله حسنت نفسي بلا إله إلا الله محمد رسول الله صلى الله عليه وآله وسلم اللهم احرسني بأينك التي لا تنام وكنفني بكنفك الذي لا يرام وارحمني بقدرتك علي فلا أهلك وأنت ثقتي ورجائي يا غياث المستغيثين يا غياث المستغيثين مستغيثين يا غيات المستغيثين يا دارك الهاريكين يا دارك الهاريكين يا دارك الهاريكين اكفني شر كل طارق يتق بي ليل او نهار الا طارق يتق بي خير انك على كل شيء قدير بسم الله ارقي نفسي من كل ما يؤذي ومن كل حاسد الله شفائي بسم الله رقيت اللهم رب الناس اذهب الباس اشفي انت الشافي وعافي انت المعافي لا, لا شفاء الا شفاءك شفاء لا يغادر سكما ولا الاما يا كافي يا فيا وافيا حميد يا مجير ارفع عني كل تعب شديد واكفني من الحد والحدير والمرض الشديد والجيش العديد واجعل لي نورا من نورك وعزا من عزك ونصرا من نصرك وبهاء من بهائك وعطاء من عطائك وحراسة من حراستك وتأييدا من تأييدك يا ذا الجلال والإكرام والمواهب العظام أسألك أن تكفيني من كل من شر كل ذي شر إنك أنت الله خادم كل أكبر وصلى الله على سيدنا محمد وآله وصحبه وسلم سليما كثيرا طيبا مباركا فيه والحمد لله العالمين ظاهرا وباطنا وعلى كل حال يا رحمة الله حمين الحمد لله وستاف رجوع في تو منت إن شاء الله
Allah barak ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen There's one part in the, in the Hizb that we do in Amr We recite in, in, from the Ayahs in a different Qira'ah Oh, so I was, I was is there it. a reason? That's just what they recite there, Amr That's what the recitation is, yeah. Hajib Yeah Tadim, they, they don't recite Hafs, they recite Amr Yeah there's another thing I saw the Masah if there was in do, uh, a duty too. I only know Amr. Amr. Is, how different is it from Hafs? Uh, it's a little different. Like in Surah Fajr, we say, Yukri Munad Yatim. They say, Tukri Munad Yatim. Mm. There's a couple of differences. Like this one, Ansar, we say, Ansarullahi. They say, Ansaran Lillahi. Hajib. Yeah. Hal. And then in his word, ha- uh, they say hifdan. Uh, wow. Or do we say hifda? I think we. No, say we say hafida. Khairun hafida. Yeah. 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 Segment number two today. Our old man is in Syria. Hit it, Zabe. Mm, let's see what Zabe's got for us here. Click. Make sure you put on desktop audio. Yeah. There he is. That's Omar right there. That's the first picture we got. And they're in the back of a truck. He's got his charity vest. You know the charities, they always wear that vest. It says GRT right there. That's Omar on the left. And that's uh, must be the local person on the ground or the, another GRT rep. And that's the document. There you go. This is Omar from Safina Society. So I'm here on behalf of GRT in the Blessed Land of Sham. As you can see, we're distributing uh, food parcels for the people in need right here in this blessed month of Ramadan. Uh, uh, well, uh, and so we have uh, food parcels each way around 30 uh, kg. Uh, alhamdulillah, you know, this, uh, in this blessed month of Ramadan, please donate. As you guys can see, this is making a huge impact, uh, especially for the people in need. So inshallah, keep the don- donations coming in. All right, that's where your fo- your falus is going. There's Omar with uh, some children, and it, just imagine that that's your childhood. Okay, do you see anything except rubble? Look at the tents in the back. That's those are probably where they live. Okay, next picture. Now he's in Turkey. This is the border now. Uh, Safina Society. So we're here with the GRT collaborating. Uh, right now we're in Rihanli, which is on the border of Syria. Over here we have uh, more than hundred thousand Syrian refugees uh, in this location alone. Uh, so as you can see, we have food packs which weigh about uh, 31 kg, which is, translates to 68 pounds, and has all essential needs for the people uh, over here, which is, you know, includes uh, butter, pasta, oil, uh, sweets, you know, canned stuff, canned goods, rice. Alhamdulillah, you know, so this should last them. So please be generous and donate uh, in this blessed month of Ramadan, uh, which is not just about fasting, but it's about giving as well, and uh, having concern for the Ummah, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Wa salamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Imagine that childhood. Go back to that. I want to watch that again. Not a single piece of greenery, not a single erection, erected uh, building. What is that? Is there a church in the background? I don't know, but. Maybe that's just construction, the way it's constructed, but not a single erected building, just those tents and a bunch of dirt. And so there, you, there it is, GRT. So that logo is there, our logo is there, that you know it comes from that money that we donated. Keep going, next picture. I was saying to my one of my family members one time, I yeah. was like, you know, I was like, these places like Yemen and, and Syria, like they're actually like super rich in history. Yeah. They've just been destroyed. They've been destroyed, they've, they've yeah. Been absolute, and the buildings have been, de- especially Syria, the buildings have just been destroyed. Yeah. And it's like, well, we're almost seeing that with Palestine. That's true. That's what they said. They were like, yeah. And yeah. I mean, that's why uh, 
like just because something's old, really doesn't mean that you know uh, it didn't have it passed. Whenever I look at someone old, I say to myself, at some point they were a strapping, you know, yeah. youth. Yeah. I, when I see an old woman, at some point she was like a pretty young lady who everyone was was desirable. When I think of a, a, an old lady, I think to myself, that was like a little cute munchkin at some point in, in history. A yeah. four-year-old munchkin or a three-year-old, five-year-old munchkin, right? That somebody looked at and just wished that they could make sure their life was perfect, right? That's what every parent looks at their kid and says. Like, go back to that kid reciting Quran. Yeah, look, pause it right there. Look at that little munchkin in the background there, right? <laughs> I mean, she's literally a munchkin. You know one of those munchkins with the powdered sugar on it that you just need to eat? That's basically her as a human form, Right? A little munchkin, but that's the life that she's living now. And someday she's going to be a 70, 80 year old woman, right? And I always think, subhanAllah, why do certain things happen to certain people? You never know. Maybe when they were young, they suffered something so badly that Allah has mercy on them later on in life. That's how I view it. Like, why do sometimes some people get away with murder sometimes? Or they just seem like they always slip by problems. You never know. Maybe they suffered something so badly when they were young that Allah gazed upon them and said, I'll take care of you for the rest of your life. Isn't this an example right here? Like, look at this, this, this boy and this girl. This is the childhood that that father envisioned. I'm assuming that's the father. Is that the childhood he envisioned? Or is maybe that's the grandfather even. Right? We, we just have gotten used to here in America. Every childhood, every kid, their life is better than the kid before. The generation before mm -hmm. it's we've been on a roll like that for a long time we may have hit, hit an end this may be the first generation where the parents say oh your child your youth stinks he's weak yeah the, he's yeah. weak his political strife yeah. right the society's torn apart everyone hates everyone uh the 90s i think was the best decade mm. this the the cold war had just ended there was one power in the whole world the united states Let's get uh, Violet. Uh, there, was one, there was one power in the whole world. Politics was not an issue to be discussed. No one talked politics when I was young. No one talked like moral issues when I was young. Nobody cared. Everything was taken care of. It's uh, as if, right? It was as if everything was taken care of. You just did what you wanted to do. People got into different things. Like uh, one guy wants to climb a mountain in Tibet. Another guy wants to start a business. Another guy wants to be an athlete. But you always did something. There was something that was not the just standard of living. The idea of worrying about prices of gas did not exist. You can imagine this. Uh, I would fill up a tank for 13 bucks. Fill. 89 cents a gallon. Right? The idea of worried about health care is not an issue. You're not worried about. You never talked about prices. You never talked about bills. These things just didn't happen. Right? In, uh, across the country. Politics was not something young people talked about. It was like tacky stuff. Now it's all morals. It's all politics. It's all drama. It's all some uh, uh, grievance or other. That's a sign of going downhill. But you see these kids. And in the future, hopefully, a lot of khair will come to them without any of their doing. And they may be done some things that are wrong. And they won't be. They'll get away with it. And not get away with it, but Allah has mercy on them, right? Because of this childhood. Can we get the link? Can you put the link up there, please, for the campaign? Even if you just go on YouTube and you look up East Turkestan yeah. or Damascus in like 1980 or 1970, it's like popping, you know? It's a, a place you go to. Yeah, yeah. Go up, look up Damascus, and keep going backwards. And Cairo, keep going backwards in the decades. It gets better. Yeah. The more secular they got, the worse. The more they imitated Europe, the worse it got. Because yeah. that imitation entailed uh, disobeying Allah. Especially if you look at East Turkestan, like the, where the Uyghurs are. Oh, my gosh. They're all wearing niqabs, and they're all, like, doing tijara and stuff. Yeah. And now what is it? I mean, go to Afghanistan, 1970. Those pictures are yeah. even Morocco, Algeria, 1900s. Yeah. Uh, you saw, subhanAllah, like uh, clean streets, even if it was old, right? But it was a society with things, things were clean, right? Egypt, even, 1950s, forget. 
even beyond that. Cairo, <laughs> nineteen fifty. Now, when you're in Egypt, you see like one old guy walking around. He's still got like the big robe on. And yeah, he got the turban on. Yeah, but he's just walking around in this like. And he looks out society. of place. Oh, he looks out. He of place. He looks totally out of place. I mean, look at these societies. Like it was. Look at that. But put that picture up of Egypt. You cannot imagine that that's Egypt because <laughs> I haven't been to Egypt for a long time. And they say now that there's the whole fifth uh, district project and all that. Feels like New York City. Look at that picture, right? No, oh, no, that, those Egypt. the new, the Egypt. new. Yeah, you've been to Egypt recently, but I'm looking at the street here. I can't see any litter. But you see this? I can't see litter here. That tree right there is healthy. You can't even see a leg. I know you can see a leg. Yeah, yeah you can see a leg. There's a um, some the liberal thing had come in, <laughs> right? But it hadn't taken over yet, right? But look at that clean streets, a sight to be seen, right? No beggars, no children with their arms cut. Uh, begging on the street these are kidnapped kids cut a finger cut an arm okay i don't know how they heal it real quick send the kid out to beg these people should be executed who do these things nothing less than that i would execute them all madiki fiqh we're allowed to do that you know in shafi fiqh they're not allowed to punish someone more than the least had punishment let me teach you something in the Sharia, Allah has established nine crimes. Nine crimes, He gave the punishment. Yeah, He gave the punishment. These are called the hudud. And these punishments are either an eye for an eye, or it's either you get struck, or you get hit, or you get killed, or you something physical. Corporal punishments. Now, in Shaf a fiqh, you're not, a, for any other punishment, outside these nine, if it's something haram or it's oppression, something sinful that's happening in public or one person oppresses another, the ruler assigns the punishment. It's called tazir. Look at these pictures. Subhanallah. Green grass, clean buildings, trees that are not dying. Okay. Let's go. So after these nine punish, nine crimes, Anything that is sinful done in public or harm and oppression, the ruler comes up with the punishment. And in Shafi'fik, he cannot hit you more than the least, the maximum he could do is the least uh, of the had punishments. That's Ted Deba Sabian, though. Yeah. So 39. From what I understand, that's what I. Don't hold me to that. Yeah, that's what I, that's what we learned. So for, forty lashes is the the min, the lowest we, uh, had punishment. So they can go to thirty nine because I know I think it's Hanafi same thing. Uh -huh. Thirty nine lashes is the max that the ruler can give somebody. We don't have that in Madiki fiqh. We can kill you, right? <laughs> we don't have this in Madiki fiqh. We do not have this limit that he he the ruler cannot do one thing only, which is take your money. He cannot take your money. He can take your life, but not your money. Right? So, for example, a crack dealer. That's not one of the had crimes. But it could be really bad for society. Yeah. We need to eliminate this person. Clean out the society from these types. These people who are kidnapping little kids, cut off a finger, cut off a wrist, cut off something, or scar their face, then they send them out to beg. Right? And then they take the proceeds. Yes, does this person not need... That, that, think about this. How evil is a human being that they actually did this? And they do it to... You see a whole line of kids in a tunnel, for example, from the... When I, last I was there, there was a tunnel between Azhar and Hussein. Yeah. That tunnel under the street is lined up with kids. One kid scarred. One kid got no wrist. One kid got no foot. And they're begging. And you say, okay, let me give them a sandwich because I know that they're, they're whoever the master wants the money is going to take the money. Let me feed them. They're like, no, no, no. We don't want food. They've been beaten so badly, these kids. They know, don't even take the food. I need the money. I'm going to get hit so badly if I don't come up with the money. This kid, you need to put a tracker on him. Track it with a GPS. Where he goes to sleep at night, raid that building. And any adult who is there, I don't care what you are. If you're caught there, you're gone. They need severe punishment, these people. Yes. So what I have so far is nine crimes per do. Nine crimes that Allah has assigned the punishment for them. And they are physical punishments. Now, there could be forgiveness, 
And there could be financial compensation, but it's the choice of the victim. And in Shafi, it's like the maximum Shafi is allowed to do is the least harmful, essentially. No, the least of the had. The least of the had. Yeah. The had is singular for hudud. Okay. Yeah. So in Hanafi fiqh and maybe Shafi fiqh, we can double check that. Then any other punishment outside these nine, the max that the ruler could do, or the government, is the least of the had. He cannot go to the least of the hut, right? So the least hut is 40 lashes. Right. So he could do 39. Right. He cannot go to the hut because they view the hut that this is the worst punishment possible. Okay. The Madiki said, no, who's, who said it's the worst? It's not necessarily the worst punishment possible. The Madiki school does not put a limit on that, so right? Fair game. fair game. He only can't take your money. That's it. Some people, they didn't do a hut crime, but they need to be unalived. They need to be backspaced. Highlight, delete, right? And society will be much better, okay? If you highlight and delete some people, okay? Some crimes are not head punishments, but this needs to happen. Life in prison doesn't make sense. As a life, life in prison, number one, we're paying for it, number yeah. one. Now, number two, what is he really suffering? Yeah, he's suffering for sure, but physically speaking, he's eating and drinking and sleeping. But here's another thing. He may be a very terrible person. He did a bad thing, but he may take care of a mom. Maybe he's taking care of a wife. Maybe he's take care, taking care of a baby, right? So why deprive them? Because you do have those Denzel Washington, American hustler types of characters where they're, they're very bad in society like mafiosos, but they are very good at home, mm-hmm. right? And they got, there's tons of people like that. I guess it makes sense too if you falsely, what's it called? Falsely accuse somebody. Yeah. Then you're just killing people then if someone's falsely or uh, like they're convicted and they didn't actually do it. By the way, had crimes, there's a certain threshold of evidence that has to be met. Yeah, that's what it's very high threshold of evidence. It's very easy for an ar- for a lawyer to argue that he didn't reach that threshold. Yeah, he did it, right? He we know he can't make him innocent, but you don't have that threshold. Right? So I'll give an example of how Muslim criminals used to get away with theft. So the had for, for, for robbery of a home is get your hands cut off. But there are conditions. So we had to define robbery. And the definition of robbery entailed a couple of things. Number one, you broke a lock. Someone left their window open, that's your problem, right? So yeah, you stole, but you didn't break a lock. So all of a sudden, you're going to be punished for something less than robbery. Okay, so number one, you you broke a lock. Number two, you stole something of value. Broke a lock, walked in, didn't see anything, and left. Yeah, so you scared us all. You did something bad, but you didn't commit robbery because you didn't take anything of value. Number three, you left the premises with that matter, with that thing. Hmm. You walked out of the premise with that, with with the item. That has to be part of it. So, for example, I break your lock, I come in, and I take pictures of your passwords and stuff like that. I didn't take anything and leave. So, it's also a crime, yes, but it's less than robbery. So, what did the old thieves used to do? One guy breaks in, he goes in the house, he sees what's in there, he takes it, he tosses it out the window. He didn't take anything out. Another guy picks it up out of the window and leaves. His partner, of course, right? So therefore, that guy, he didn't break a lock. He didn't steal anything. The first guy, right, uh, didn't break a lock. Sorry, the first guy only broke the lock. The second guy walked in an open door, right? Stole the item, threw it out the window. All three of them are thieves, right? But none of them did fulfill all three of the had requirements so they are thieves they will be punished but they get to keep their hand that's how knowledge benefits you right (laughs) (laughs) so that's how it works anything that has to do with another person the the victim is brought forth and the victim has the right now to either let's say he's found the, the criminals found guilty there are three possibilities Either 
Yes, I want to watch him get the head punishment. Number two, I don't want him to have the head punishment. Give me financial compensation instead. And there's a table for this. The prophet established a, literally a table for what the human body is worth. We're not saying what life is worth. What the human body is worth. Right? We talked about this. And we said it's worth four th a thousand grams, a thousand dinar, which each dinar is 4.25 grams of gold. So 4,250 grams of gold. That's the whole body. So an eye is worth half that. Two eyes, full. Uh, every part of the body is worth something. Okay, So there's a table for that. So you have the option of three things. Number one, I want to watch him get punished. And you can watch him get punished. Number two, he can do the punishment too if he wants. Number two, I don't want that. I want financial compensation. Number three, I forgive him altogether. Okay, And you can forgive a portion of the compensation. So, for example, the compensation is uh, $50,000. I'll take 20000 right? So you can do that. You can forgive. Now, what happens if it's a murder? Obviously, the victim can't speak. Who speaks then? The inheritors that are established in the Qur'an. The Qur'an establishes the inheritors. So when a person dies, his parents inherit, his spouse is an inheritor, and his kids are an inheritor. In the absence of kids, for example... And parents, the siblings get involved. So there's different scenarios, but they're established in the Qur'an. So when, when a person is killed, let's say there are five inheritors. Let's say there's a mom, a wife, and three kids. They all come to the court. The judge says, inheritors, we have found the criminal, and we found him guilty, and we have footage, and we have witnesses, and we have enough evidence. We know 100% he's the guilty party. What do you want to do? Do you want to see him kid, killed, executed? If all of them say yes, then he's executed. If only one person says no, we can't execute him because you can't partially execute somebody. Okay? So let's say one of them says no, I don't want execution. All right, fine. What do we do now? Financial compensation. Okay? You're all going to get the dia. How are we going to get the dia? The dia is the financial compensation. The dia is going to be divided amongst you based on what you would have inherited from this person. A mother inherits one-sixth, in this case, because there are kids. The wife inherits one-eighth. Let's say there's two boys and a girl. Okay, Then the re remainder gets divided into one, two, three, four, five parts. Two parts for each boy, one part for a girl, for the girl. Okay, Because the remainder in inheritance, the remainder after all the fractions are given away, the remainder goes to the kids, and each boy will take two. Because he's paying for himself and his wife in the future or present. So a boy gets inherits two shares. And a girl only sh inherits one. Okay, She inherits her share. A boy gets double because he'll have responsibilities. So let's. So that's how the, 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 the money will be distributed. All right. Let's say the wife, she says one eighth. And I know the murderer. Usually we know the murderer, right? You know, the murderer is not usually a stranger. It was somebody we know. And the, let's say the wife says, it's my cousin, right? And I know my cousin has a hot temper and he didn't mean it. The wife can say, look, anyone can say, I forgo my share of the inheritance. I forgive or, or my share of the dia. So now he has to pay seven eighths of the dia, not uh, and the one eighth is gone. Let's say the daughter sees that and she says, uh, yeah, I'm going to be like my mom and forgive. I forgive him completely. Right. And she forgoes her percentage of the dia. Right. So now he ends up, let's say, owing hypothetically five eighths of the dia. Where does he get the, all this money from? Because that's a lot of money. He's supposed to technically go to his tribe and his tribe has to pay for it. They divide it up amongst themselves. All the households of the tribes, based on how much money they have, and they all pitch in, and immediately, the same day, the guy gets his money. The family gets their money the same day, right? Not, you're going to get your weight in, in the mail for a check, like five months later, you get a check in the mail or something like that. No. Or wait because he's having an appeal, then another appeal, then another appeal, and then 30 years pass before we have a final conclusion. That's how it is in the United States, right? Appeals after appeal after appeal, nobody knows when this is going to end. To get the money right away, the tribe pays it. Let's say the tribe cannot pay it. He can gather sadaqah. He can get zakah money. He can go fundraise for it. 
right? So on and so forth. Because now there are no tribes anymore. That's the problem. So who pays these deals? In Iran is the only country that has this system. I think Saudi too. But Iran, although they're Shia, they're doing it right when it comes to this. They actually have nonprofits that go around collecting dia money for people in debt, or for or people who owe the dia. From where, like, for uh, all these things, dia. Yeah. People committed crimes, right? And they go and they—it's a nonprofit and they raise the money for these people. Yeah. This is called restitutional justice when the victim is involved in the process. Now let's compare it to the system here. Mm-hmm. A a parent gets killed or a wife gets killed or something like that. What happens? What happens to, uh, the, the, let's say, the inheritors, this family? They sit in the courtroom and they sit there and watching. That's it. Nobody's, after the person's found guilty, they don't get to see anything good. The guy goes to jail and eats and sleeps, right? And sometimes he has a TV in there. And sometimes he's playing pool, right? And ping pong and other crazy things like that. In general population, prison, sometimes it's like so laid back, you'd be like, what is this, right? They open up all... I've seen documentaries of this. They open up all the, um, the gates of the jail cells. These guys are coming out. These guys are learning how to make tattoos. The guys are, there's a TV up there. They're sitting around watching TV. And all like the guard only has the TV, the, the, the remote. They're sitting around watching TV, watching games, watching ESPN. Right? This is jail? This is punishment? No, hit the guy a couple times and send him home. Let him work and benefit the economy again. All right? And benefit his family instead of sitting there learning basically from other gangsters, learning how to be a bum, sleeping in all day. For what? Oh, he sold a couple bags of weed. No one should ever go to jail for that. Right on the spot. The, the guy catches you with drugs. The cop, forget court. He sees you right away. He gets two other witnesses. Hey, you guys see that this is weed? Yeah, it's weed. All right. Turn the body cams on. Boom, 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 boom. Gone. Right. Send him back home. He'll never do this again. Right? Immediate, instead of dragging this through the courts, and why are they going through the courts? Everyone's making money off of every criminal. That's why. The guy who's selling them the food, the guy who makes the uniform, the guy who dry cleans the uniforms, the guy who uh, owns the, the property on, where the jail cell is, they need constant, nonstop yeah. criminals to feed this corrupt financial system, which they themselves need to be punished for establishing. And private right? jail? Uh, I wonder what percentage of jails are private privately owned it's ridiculous business there should there are certain businesses in islam will never exist the money lending business will never exist in islam it will not exist the insurance industry can exist in a halal way not in the way it exists right now okay um what else this private jail industry that's actually it's only eight percent but eight percent of jails are private but i but every single vendor is private the vendors that provide the food the vendors that provide probably the guards are outsourced now by by companies no one probably the state's not hiring guards anymore who knows probably outsourced everything is a business and this poor kid selling weed turns out to be the most innocent kid of all i'm telling you we had a brother in connecticut why we spent three years in jail why because of how many times he sold weed you went through jail three times for this i mean for for years just because of this I think three years of pen in jail for, for this. For getting caught so many times selling weed. They should have just been hit on the spot. And after all that, honestly, everyone's guilty. They're, they're, the vendors that lobby to make sure the, these are, there are more crimes and more criminals. And they want to make sure they see these kids coming in and out of jail. Right? Because they're all benefiting from it. Okay? Totally messed up self system. Okay. So you see, these are in, in now in Madiki fiqh, we attach all sexual deviances with fornication. All sexual deviances are going to fornication and adultery. Okay. So, um, luat, homosexuality, same thing. In, in Hanafi fiqh, I don't think it's the same. Hanafi fiqh is literally by the letter of the law. There's no analogy here. Mm. Maddox said, no, it is by analogy. All these deviations, these sexual deviations, we're going to lump it up with fornication. Okay? And keep in mind, keep in mind for fornication, 
is very important to know. It is public fornication. Four witnesses must see penetration. So that means you see two guys, uh, two people holding hands. No, you go and you look in their window, and and, and you broke in to see them. Doesn't count. They were trying to hide themselves. It counts with Allah that they are sinning with God, right? In the sight of God. But the Sharia here is for the public behavior. Which you do behind closed doors, the, the Sultan cannot just go in and try to look in and, 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 and get you, you know, arrested. So he's not allowed to do that. Umar ibn Khattab came upon a house and he kept hearing loud noise, music, sound like drunk people. So he climbed over their roof, the, the wall of the house. He, he scaled the wall of the house, came in and broke it all up and said, let's go, you're all getting punished. Now, the, the person there, he was a second generation Muslim, but he was learned. And he said, no, none of that's going to happen. Right? And so Omar said, here you are, you're doing it. He said, no, because you scaled the roof. You scaled the walls and you came in through the roof. You're not allowed to do that. So you actually should be punished. Breaking an entry, right? So Amr ibn Khattab gave him a stern warning and he said, you're right. You're not going to be punished, right? But I advise you, make tawbah to Allah and shut down this public house. It used to be a public house. was That's where we get the pub from. It's someone's house, but he basically opens it up for anyone who wants to commit sins at night. And they drink and there are women there and all that nonsense, right? So that's the origin of the club. It used to be someone's house. So Omar advised him, Shut it down, close it down. And he did, and he, re he repented. Okay. There is mercy with these hudud. The Prophet, peace be upon him, said, seek out a way out of the hudud. Right? Just try to find some doubtful matter, okay, that would downgrade the crime from hadworthy to tazir. Tazir is when we as a society decide the punishment. So, for example, a person who's committing zina, let's say four people said, I saw this people fornicating. The window was wide open. We saw them fornicating. We sit down with the first one. You saw this? Yes, 100%. Guaranteed I saw it. He said the second, guaranteed 100%. You saw this? Right? I said, I actually, I really don't know if I saw that exactly. I know that they were together. Okay, there we go. Drop it. So try to find doubt. Because there is some mercy in the law too. It's not all just... Uh, quick with the uh, strike you know it's it's not how it is okay let's turn now to another segment the cousins of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam our segment we read from this book here it's called ash-shajara and nabawiyah from our love of the Messenger, sallallahu alaihi wasallam, part of it is to read uh, everything about him. And we're now on the cousins of the Prophet from his male side, for his uncle's side, the, his father's side. Sorry, from the father's side, the first uncle, paternal uncle, was Al Hadith, and and he had a son named, which is the Prophet's cousin. Abdullah ibn al-Harith wa laysa lahu aqib kana ismuhu Abd al-Shams fasammahu Rasulullah Abdullah mata fi hayati Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam so his cousin Abdullah ibn al-Harith entered Islam he was Abd al-Shams and the Prophet called him Abdullah okay next one Abu Sufyan ibn al-Harith of course not to be confused with Abu Sufyan ibn Harb the Abu Sufyans are two Major Abu Sufyan's. And there's a third one that came later. There's Abu Sufyan ibn al-Harith, cousin of the Prophet. And there's Abu Sufyan ibn Harb. And then Muawiyah, and then there's, uh, yeah, there's, these are the two major Abu Sufyan's, just two. Two Abu Sufyan's. Abu Sufyan ibn Harb is from another clan completely. Another, uh, but, and of course he's the more prominent one because he was the enemy of the Prophet for so long. And Abu Sufyan ibn al-Harith, his name is Al-Mughira. He was a famous poet. Okay. And he used to be somebody who used his poetry against the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. 
but ثم من الله عليه وقواه في الإسلام. Then Allah guided him and made him strong in Islam. Abu Sufyan ibn al Harith. And he was in on on the day of Hunayn. You remember the day of Hunayn was when the Muslims suffered for the first time the false sense of security. They had so overwhelmed the enemy in numbers with numbers, and with the whole support of Arabia over at Taif. Now Mecca has entered Islam. No one is stopping it in front of the Muslims. And the Bani Thaqif, the tribe, Bani Thaqif, from the city of Ta'if, came out to meet the Muslims in battle at an area called Hunayn. The Muslims there had had suffered a different kind of uh, defeat that day, which was the false sense of security. And they didn't turn to Allah in desperation the way they did before. As a result, they began losing the battle. And the Prophet ﷺ found himself in a very dangerous situation where he was surrounded by the enemy. A large number of the enemy had penetrated all the way to the Messenger of Allah ﷺ, and he was surrounded by Al-Abbas and Talha and Zubair and very few Sahaba protecting the Prophet at this moment where the Prophet could have been killed. From amongst them was Abu Sufyan ibn Harith. وَمَاتَ فِي سَنَةِ سِتٍ وَعِشْرِينَ He died in the year 26 when Umar ibn Khattab was the Khalifa. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said to him, إِنِّي لَأَرْجُوا أَن تَكُونَ خَلَفًا مِنْ حمزة. I pray that you are the successor of Hamza. Hamza was the Prophet's cousin. His most beloved on the earth, it seems, that's the way the Prophet talks about Hamza sometimes. And I'm the uncle. The uncle. The, uh, the uncle. Uh, his uncle from the um, paternal side, but cousin from the mother's side. Because if you remember, his, the moms are siblings. Yeah. So the uncle of the prophet from his dad's side, but his cousin from his mom's side. Because the prophet's father and grandfather married two sisters. So the prophet's father married Amina, and the prophet's grandfather married Amina's older sister. And from there, from Abdullah and Amina, the Prophet was born. And from Abdul Muttalib and Amina's older sister, Hamza was born. So he's related to Hamza in two ways, in these two ways. So he said, I hope that you are a khalaf, you are the successor of Hamza. Now, you, when you wonder how is it or why is it that in these battles, the Prophet ends up surrounded by his family? Well, why didn't the other companions care and go and defend him? The reason for that is that the Prophet used to div- divvy up the battalions based on tribes to give you multiple reasons to defend. One reason is that you're you're in war in the first place. That's one thing. But when you're at war with your cousins and your brothers, you want to protect your family too. So yes, you're striving for the sake of Allah, but also when it's your brother next to you, you're, be, you're going to be extra careful. When it's your nephew next to you. So the Prophet divided up the battalions by clans and families. Okay? And that's why the Prophet in this case ended up surrounded by his family. It is narrated that Abu Sufyan ibn al-Harith sensed that he would die and dug up his own grave three days before his death. We mentioned this, that sometimes Allah gives a, sig- a sign to the people of Allah of when they're going to die. He gives them indicators of this. Number three. Umayyah ibn al-Harith. There was no no biography for him. Number four. Nawfal ibn al-Harith. Okay. Kana asanna min ammayhi Hamza wal Abbas. He was older than Hamza and Abbas. Wa min akhawayhi. وَكَانَ مِمَّنْ ثَبَتَ مَعَ رَسُولِ اللَّهِ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَمْ يَوْمَ حُنَيْنِ Again, he was there on the day of Hunayn, the day of that battle. He was in that small group that formed a semicircle around the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم. وَتُوُفِيَ لِسَنَتَيْنِ خَلَتَا مِنْ خِلَافَةِ عُمَرِ He died again in the Khilafah of Umar and he was buried in the Baqiyah. رَبِيعَةُ ابن الْحَارِثِ And he's also known as Abu Arwa. Okay. And he was older than Abbas. 
He didn't attend Badr with the pagans because he was in Syria. The Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam used to give him money from Khaybar every year. And he died in the Khilafah of Omar. And of course he had entered Islam. Otherwise the Prophet wouldn't have given him fate. Right? The, when the Muslims conquer a land and they uh, gain wealth from that land, the Khalifa gives it to whoever he wants. And in Islam, the family of the Prophet do not receive charity. What they do receive is these spoils of war instead or any of the government's income. The government can own land, grow the land, sell the produce, and have uh, uh, income. So the government can have different forms of income. That's what takes care of Ahlul Bayt, the family of the Prophet, peace be upon him. However, when this doesn't happen, then Ahl bayt can take zakah and it's treated as a gift. Can you check? I wonder if it's ha, 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 Shafi school say the same thing. Because we say in Maliki school, the, rule, the condition is Ahl bayt cannot receive zakah if the government's taking care of them. If there's no bayt al-mad. If there exactly. Bayt if there's a bayt al-mad and the government takes care of them. Next one is Arwa, the daughter of Al-Harith. Okay. Okay. And there's not much biography there. The next uncle of the Prophet is Hamza. So Hadith, he lists Hadith first, then he lists Hamza. Hamza had three kids. No, sorry. Yeah, he had three kids. Ya'la, Omara, and Fatima. We only know of one. Biography for Fatima bint Hamza. She married Al Miqdad ibn al Aswad and she even narrated some hadith from the Prophet. Okay. Number three Fatima bint, uh, uh, sorry, the sons of Abu Lahab. Abu Lahab was the worst enemy of the Prophet, peace be upon him. Vicious. And he was in the family. And he had he had sons. Okay, how many sons did he have here? Let's count it. He had four sons. Let's read about them. The first one was Utba. Ibn, uh, Ibn Abi Lahab. Ruqayya was married to Utba. Ruqayya, the daughter of the Prophet, was married to Utba. Bintu Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa When the revelation came... Abu Lahab said, and the Tabbat Yada Abi Lahab bin Watab was revealed about the future of Abu Lahab being eternal hellfire. He said to his son, You better divorce this woman right now. So he divorced her. After that, the Prophet remarried her to the great companion Uthman ibn Affan. Okay. Now, what is the result of Utbah? He entered Islam. On the day of Al Fatih, he entered Islam. He stayed a non believer for the entirety of the prophetic message until the day of the conquest of Mecca. Utbah entered Islam. And the Prophet ﷺ prayed for him. And he, ent- he attended the battle of Hunayn. And he lived and he died in Mecca. So Utbah, the son of Abu Lahab, Entered Islam. Okay. Now, there was one son who was worse. Worse. And that is Utayba ibn Abi Lahab. Utayba ibn Abi Lahab was the second boy. He also okay, was married to one of the daughters of the Prophet. And he divorced her. He sent her back because his dad made him. But he had a very bad attitude. One time, the, the prophet was walking. Now, this is his nephew. This is the prophet's nephew. Or sorry, the prophet's cousin. But he's younger. He's much younger. And young enough to be married to his daughter. So he sees the prophet. And the prophet's older than him. He sees the prophet and he spits on the ground. This was for them, even for us, is 
like a bad insult. This is a bad insult. The Prophet ﷺ said, May Allah send a dog upon you. Because you're, you, like, you are bad as a dog. The Prophet ﷺ said, May Allah send a dog upon you. So, when the word spread that Muhammad has cursed Utayba with a dog, right? Abu Lahab hired security for him. What does that tell you? He believes it, right? He knows Allah is going to answer him. Why would you hire security guards for Utayba if you believe he's a false prophet? If a Hindu comes and he says all the prayers in the world against me, right? I'm going to say, قُلْ أَعُوذِ بِرَبِّ الْفَلَقِ مِنْ شَرِمَ خَلَمْ شَرَى سَرِنَذُوكَ I'm going to recite Surah Al-Falaq three times, Surah Al-Nas three times. And I'm going to know he can't touch me. Him and all his demons and his jinn. I got this big, massive Hindu temple here in Edison, right off the turnpike, and we have to look at it every single time that we drive on the turnpike. All their shayateen. It can't affect me. Now, if a completely false prophet, a completely delusional person comes and he prays against me, I'm not going to bat an eye. There's nothing there. So for the Abu Lahab to now hire security guards for his son, there's some cognitive dissonance going on there. Well, what ends up happening? That night, a mountain lion comes down. Out of nowhere, runs right past the security guards, through people, and kills Otaiba. Attacks him, bites him in the neck, kills him, and leaves. So they said to Abu Lahab, now what do you say of your nephew? Right? He said, now look what he says. He said, no, it's not a real prophecy. Because the prophet prayed for, he said, Muhammad said, oh Allah send a dog upon Utayba. But this was a lion. Right? This was a lion. Not a dog. So nothing, not a real prophecy coincidence they said you fool when muhammad asked for a dog god sends a lion mm. is not one of the best lines subhanallah that just that just that tells you the rank of the prophet right there the prophet peace be upon him made dua against him with a dog may allah send a dog upon him allah sent a lion so they said, when Muhammad asked his Lord for a dog, his Lord sends him a lion. That tells you the rank of the Prophet right there, sallallahu alayhi wa That's why we do this. We read everything about the Prophet to, to catch on to those coattails of that acceptance, that divine acceptance, that rank he has with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Maybe we can get that. Maybe our du'as will be answered. Allah protects us from sins and he lets us live righteously. No one is without, no one is living a life of the masajid, life of piety except that it is a gift from Allah it's not because of your efforts it's your own gifts it's it's Allah giving us a gift perhaps we respected somebody who deserved respect and so Allah therefore protected us and ennobled us with Islam and seeking knowledge like what are we doing here we could be doing other things but Allah caused us inspired us God gave us the idea in our head to read these books to do this live stream right to do all these things could be from respecting somebody at some point whom Allah loves. If we can't, well, we do it by reading their biographies and, and honoring them. The next one was Mu'attib, the son of Abu Lahab. He is the second boy of Abu Lahab to enter Islam. He also entered Islam on the day of the conquest of Mecca. And the Prophet prayed for him. And he was also with him on the day of Hunayn. Okay. And he fought with the Prophet so much that he actually lost an eye. Okay. Next was uh, Umm Thalatha Utba wa Utayba wa Mu'attiban Umm Jamil Who is the mother of these three boys? Umm Jamil Umm Jamil Bint Harb Ibn Umayya Okay. Ibn Abd al-Shams what? And that is who Who is she? The sister of Abu Sufyan Many people don't know this Umm Jamil Is mentioned in the Quran 
in Surat Habib cometh in Sirat. Umm Jamil is mentioned in Abu Surat Al Lahab. Tabat Yada Abi Lahab in Watab. Magna Anu Maru Makasab says Lanar and Data Lahab. Umra to Hamalat Al Hatab. Fiji there. Umra to Hamalat Al Hatab. Fiji there. Hablum in Masad. Allah says that Abu Lahab is rebuked. Tabat Yada Abi Lahab in Watab. Magna Anu Maru Makasab. He will be in the fire forever, Abu Lahab. He could have stopped Islam right there by becoming a Muslim. If he said the Shahada, then the Quran would have been wrong, right? But he was too blind to do that. Allah says he's going to be in the fire. Then his wife is in the fire carrying the firewood, right? Carrying the firewood that's going to burn her and her husband. And around her neck is a rope out of fire. Why did Allah mention these two things about Umm Jamil? Because Umm Jamil did have, in fact, a beautiful necklace. Okay? And some tell a story about it, and I have to research whether it's true or not, that that necklace actually belonged to one of the Prophet's daughters. And she refused to give it back after the divorce. So Allah said, you're going to have a necklace of fire. The other reason is she used to gather the garbage every day, or the uh, thorns. She used to gather thorny twigs and put it in the path where she knew the Prophet used to walk. Okay? So this woman is Abu Sufyan's sister. She is the aunt of Muawiyah. Okay? So these two lines had intersected in a um, a, a wicked family. Abu Lahab on one hand, and Umm Jamil. Of course, now Abu Sufyan and Muawiyah, they enter Islam. So we can't say anything about them. They entered Islam. And from Umm Jamil, two out of her three boys entered Islam. But they entered Islam when? They entered Islam on the day of the conquest. When we say the day of the conquest, what do we mean by that? The Prophet said him lived 13 years in Mecca, was expelled by them. They had to, all the Muslims had to leave. They all went to Medina. And they went and they started the war with Mecca continued. But now they have a city. They have an army. They have a, pl a place of refuge. And they're building the city. People are migrating to the city. Eventually, after some, many things happened, there was a truce between Mecca and Medina. There was a truce. The, in, during the time of this truce, truce, the Muslims became stronger and stronger and stronger. After one year of the truce, the Meccans broke the truce. That means it's over. War is back on. But at this time, Quraysh, Mecca, they were so depleted, they couldn't put up a fight. In contrast, the, all of the momentum and the energy was with the Prophet wasallam and the Muslims. So they marched in, surrounded Mecca, and Mecca didn't put up a fight. They completely submitted. That's called Yawm al-Fatih. Okay? And that's so when the Prophet signed the truce the fight was still on and the Sahaba didn't understand what was happening. Why would we sign a truce? We're like about to defeat them. We're getting stronger. Why would we sign a truce? Now the truce, Allah revealed Quran about it, Surah Al-Fat, and called it a victory, a conquest. Why is that? It's because, because of this, in the year that's to come, okay, number one, they're not going to keep the truce for 10, it was a 10 year truce. Mecca, the Quraysh don't have the discipline for that. They're going to break it. But in that period of time in which they have the truce, so the Muslims were able to go visit Mecca, make Umrah. Their families were converting to Islam in Mecca. Okay? The Muslims were getting stronger and stronger and stronger. And the Meccans weaker and weaker and weaker. And then finally when they broke the truce, the Muslims were able to come in, surround them, and the Meccans put their arms up and said, no mas. Okay? We can't fight anymore. We give up. Now you have a victory without any bloodshed. This is what Allah says in Surah Al-Fatih. Okay? No bloodshed. There was just a skirmish only in one part of the city. That's it. No bloodshed. So now the Meccans can come into Islam at least with less bitterness. Because when you conquer someone by force, they're very bitter. This was a conquest. The Prophet came in, put the army, and said, no one's going to, there's not, the shields, the sword's not going to come out today. The army's here, yes. No one's going to be struck today. No, no sword is going to come out of its sheath today. 
It's the day of mercy. It's the day of forgiveness. And he spent some period of time there just forgiving everybody, greeting everyone after all those years, and uh, bringing them into Islam. So they entered Islam with a lot less of the bitterness than they would have entered if it was through fighting. So the word Nasr means victory with fighting. And Fath means victory without any fighting. Okay. That's why Fath is one of the best words you can have. Habib Omar named our school Darul Fath. It's going to be a victory with peace. Peacekeeping people, right? People who are going to have victory, we're going to win, right? And dominate, but in a peaceful way, without hurting anyone's feelings, right? With no bitterness, None of that violence. Now the Nasr was against Thaqif. The Bani Thaqif. The tribe is called Bani Thaqif. The city is called the Ta'if. They were the twin city to Mecca. It's equally rich city. They had their own idols. They were called the Ta'if. That city was called the Ta'if and the people were called the Bani Thaqif. Those people came out to fight the Prophet. They still were stubborn. They were not, were not giving up. And that battle was called Hunayn. So when Allah reveals the Quran, إِذَا جَاءَ نَصْرُ اللَّهِ وَالْفَتْحِ The Nasr is Hunayn and the Fatah is Mecca. Because Hunayn, Ta'if, they were conquered by force. Because they were conquered by force, you came out to fight, it's all ours now. The whole city's ours. If you give up, خلاص, I don't take your property. You give up, you didn't fight. But if you do fight and I defeat you, then all your wealth is mine now. Right? That's how... War works. That's how the old world used to operate. Even today, so it's probably the same thing. Now, when the pro- when that whole city became the the property of the Muslims, and one fifth of the spoils of war goes to the leader, the government to do what he wants with it. And there wasn't an elaborate government back then. Who was the government? The Prophet, peace be upon him. That's it. So th- for those period of days, the Prophet ﷺ was the wealthiest man in Arabia because his portion of the spoils of war from the battle of Hunayn made him the wealthiest man in all of Arabia. Why is that important? And what did the Prophet do with it? It's important because although the Prophet ﷺ said, I choose to be Prophet slave. Although you got the evidence? Good. After like 20 so minutes satisfying. of research. Yeah, it's so satisfying to find evidence. Uh, he's going to give us some evidence right now. Shafi Fiqh. Although the Prophet Sallallahu chose to be Prophet's slave and never slept with a single gold or silver coin in his house, nor leftover food ever in his house. It was always given away. Allah Ta'ala wanted to show everybody he is not like this out of a deficiency. He's choosing this life because it's superior in the sight of Allah. And it's superior in the sight of the hearts of the Muslims. The brokenhearted, poor Muslims, when they see the Prophet is living more simpler than them, they love him even more. Okay? And, they, and nobody could accuse him of benefiting from this prophethood. Oh, yeah, yeah, like, yeah, let's be a prophet. Why not? Well, you're getting rich, right? They could say he has two motivations. No, let's eliminate that completely. Where is the benefit? Where is he benefiting from this? Right? He's, he's living a life that before this, he lived a better life. As, as a merchant in Mecca, he lived a far better life. He had property, he had money, he had food, he had everything. So Allah willed to show the rich that he is capable of becoming wealthier than you. That's very important. So for a period of a few days, the Prophet was the wealthiest man in the world, uh, in Arabia. What did he do with it? He gave it all away to the people of Ta'if, especially their elites, to soften their hearts. Any man who came and was on the brink of entering Islam, the Prophet gave him amounts of wealth that that person could not imagine. So the Concern of the Prophet ﷺ was not conquering people. It was winning their hearts over. Sometimes your ego, the ego was too tough to penetrate the heart, so it must be brought down by force. And that's how you have to view the conquests. These 
you have a heart and you have an outer shell of the ego. If we can't melt that ego away, if you can't bring it down yourself, right? If a little problem can't bring your ego down and you're so stubborn, we have to forcibly take it down. And that's what the conquest, forcibly take. But we don't want to hurt your heart. So the Prophet filled them with wealth. Amounts of wealth that a man once came to the Prophet uh, came to a valley to look at the spoils of war. Okay? Animals that he can't count from how many animals were there. The Prophet walked up right next to him. He said, do you like what you see? And the man, he hated the Prophet. He said, and who wouldn't? The Prophet said, take it, it's all yours. So the man said, you, you, you defeat us. It's not enough that you defeat us. Now you have to mock us with these suggestions, these, these, these things. He said, I'm a master of Allah. I don't speak except the truth. Take it. It's all yours. The man lost it. He started yelling, come and enter, uh, believe in the man who doesn't fear poverty. And he said, at this moment, you were the most hated person to me. And now you're the most beloved person to me. The Prophet was concerned with winning the hearts over people. And that's what our da'wah should be like too. Okay. All right, Ryan, let's hear the evidence. So the asl, What's the, course, r- repeat the mas'ala too for those who are just joining in. Is, uh, can you give zakah to uh, Bani Hashim and Bani Mutalib? All right. So the question is, in Shafi Fiqh, can you, give, uh, can you ever give zakah to the sons of Hashim, the Ahl al-Bayt? Bani so, Hashim, Bani Abdul Muttalib. So originally the answer is no. Mm-hmm. And then at the end of the chapter it says, إِذَا مُنِعَ بَنُوا هَاشِمْ وَبَنُوا مُطَّلِبْ مِنْ خَمْسٍ خَمْسٍ فَفِي جَوَازٍ دَفْعِ الزَّكَاةِ لَهُمْ وَجْهَانِ الْأَصَاهِ أَنْهُ لَا تَحِلْ الْوَجْهِ الثَّانِي تَحِلْ قَالَ بِهِ أَبُو سَعِيلِ الْأَسْتَخْرِي وَأَفْتَى بِهِ بَعْضُ الشَّافِعِيَّةِ وَذَلِكَ إِذَا انْقَطَعَ حَقُّهُمْ مِنْ خَمْسٍ خَمْسٍ لِيَخُلُّوا بَيْتَ الْمَالِ مِنْ الْفَيْءِ وَالْغَنِيمَةِ أَوْ لِاسْتِيلَاءِ الظُّلْمَةِ وَاسْتِبْدَادِهِمْ وَاسْتِبْدَادِهِمْ بِهِمَا وَكَانُوا مِنْ أَصْنَافِ الْمُسْتَحِقِينَ لِلزَّكَاةِ لِآدَمِ تَضِيعِهِمْ وَمُرَاعَى شَأْنِهِمْ ويجوز إعطائهم من من صدقات التطوع والهبات بالاتفاق. So that part translate that part translate the whole thing actually if, for everybody. If Bani Hashim and Bani Muttalib are prevented from the fifth of a fifth, خمس خمس is that what it is? Yeah. Fifth of a fifth for fee jawaz it it could be possible it could be allowed to give zakat to them. There are two. There's two opinions the first one is that it is not allowed the second one is that it is allowed and قال أبو سعيد الأستخري شيخ and after and some of the Shafi'iyah gave the fatwa that it is valid if the rights of their fifth of a fifth is cut off if mm-hmm. they don't have it because the bait of mal is no longer there mm-hmm. um, with fay and ghanima what's ghanima? Fay is like like money. The ghanima is the animals. Oh, uh, yeah. animals. Oh, li istila idhulma. What's that? Uh, oppression, I think. Wa istibdadihim bihima. Istibdadihim. Yeah. Wa kanu min asna, but it's with the condition that they're from one of the eight categories of people that can take zakah. Mm. Right. So there you go. Ahl al-Bayt, even in Shafi'i fiqh, just like in Maliki fiqh, if the state isn't taking care of them with Bayt al-Mal and the Khums and, and that aspect, they take zakah. We got to see what the Hanafis say about that too. And it's not allowed for them if they were working as the cat for the, at the, as the Amilin, it's not allowed. They, if, they, if the Ahl al-Bayt works in zakah distribution or in the military or in anything where it is funded by the zakah money, they can only work there. They cannot work uh, in distributing zakah in the first place. And B, if they work as a soldier, they can't work as a soldier if it's their salary comes from zakah, because zakah is used for the army too. Okay. Good research there. What's the book? It's the same book. I saw this yesterday when I was doing the other thing you asked me. That's why I, I knew to go to this book. Al Manhaji. No, no, Al Muatamat. The Muatamat. Who's the author of the Muatamat? 
محمد محمد الزحبلي زحبلي لا لا زحيلي زهيلي زهيلي نمبر 4 ذا فورث تشايلد اوف ابو لهب واز ا دوتر دره خرجت الى الحارث ابن عامر ابن نوفل ابن عبد مناف لها منه عقبة والوليد وغيرهما روت درة عن النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم وهي من الصحابة أبو لهب's daughter Durra entered Islam she is a companion and we'll stop here at having read those uncles of the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم and their children okay. somebody's asking what's the preferred one it said the, the asah is that they don't take it though it's preferable that they don't take it even if Bayt al-Mal is not taking care of them right okay preferable they not take it What's the difference between the Muwatta and the Mudawana? The Muwatta is Imam Malik's book on Hadith. And it's his entries. Uh, it's, it's considered basically Hadith, sayings of companions, uh, action of Ahl al-Madinah, and his own fatwa. So he wrote the Muwatta. Now later on, one of his, his best student, his greatest student, Mamadik's greatest student. Uh, of course, Shafi is his most famous student. And uh, Shafi is Shafi, right? There's no doubt about that. But Imam Malik, he had a student named Abdurrahman. Okay. Uh, 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 and he was from Egypt. And this man studied with Malik for like 20 years. Okay. Uh, so Sahnun is a, a man from Tunisia came over. And he wrote, he, he asked him questions. Okay, he asked him questions uh, f- and wrote this voluminous book on what would Medic say about this? What did Medic say about this? What did Medic say about this? Okay, that, that man, his name is Abdul Rahman ibn al Qasim. He's Egyptian and he spent so many years with Medic. 20 years. 20 years, yeah. And when he went back to Egypt, the Tunisians and the Egyptians all come study with him. So a Tunisian named Asad ibn al-Furat came and sat with him and documented all of his knowledge. Then went back and taught it. One of his students, Asad's students, named Sahnun, came and said, let me go to the source myself. He took the book, traveled to Egypt, sat with Abdurrahman ibn al-Qasim, and they went over the book. And, and Abdurrahman bin Qasim said, no, I don't like the way some of it's written. Change this, change that, add this, add that, remove this, okay, and go back with it. So Sahnun went back and he said, hey, uh, teacher, Asad, our sheikh, Abdurrahman bin Qasim, he, he said he wanted to change some things. Here's the new edition. Asad ibn Furat then got upset. Right, he got upset with this. Like, what is this? My young student going and, and telling me uh, there was mistakes. I'm out. He went to the governor. He said, "Send me out of here. I don't want to be around here anymore." He was like embarrassed, maybe or something. So the governor said, "All right, get him. Take some military. Take some soldiers and go conquer Sicily." So he went and they went and conquered Sicily, which is that little island off of the coast of Italy. Italy looks like a boot kicking a rock. The rock is Sicily. They went and they conquered Sicily. That's what the Muslims used to do when they're in a bad mood, right? I'm not, I'm not feeling this anymore, right? Let me go conquer a, an island or something. And Sahnun became the sheikh of Tunisia. And he taught the school, the Madhab Imam Malik there. And it spread all across North Africa. That's the history of the book called the Mudawana. The Mudawana is literally just that which is written down, right, and, and bound. That's literally what it means. Tadween is to write things down and to document things. So mudawana literally means the document. Muatta means the trodden path. Because Malik's law, he says, we make law on what the Prophet ﷺ established so widely that it can have no doubt. We don't make law on a saying here or there. We make law on what the Prophet established so thoroughly that it's like a path that's been walked on so much in the middle of the woods. Like everything's dead there. It's just a path. It's a very clear path. That's what the muatta means. The, the trodden path. We, don't, we make law on that which is crystal clear. Let's open up questions. 
In your experience, what is the one silver bullet dawah point that achieves the most shahadas? Honestly, it's not a single point. It's generosity. Generosity is the best dawah. People's hearts lean towards you when you're nice to them and generous to them. And then their mind does the rest, really. Their mind will start justifying why they like you. That's the thing. You don't have to worry about their mind. If you worry about their heart, their mind will start coming up with reasons why they want to like you, right? Was Ibn, Qa Ibn al Qasim and Ibn Wahab Mujtahid Mutlaq? I don't believe either one was Mujtahid Mutlaq, no. Or they at least never tried. What is a Mujtahid Mutlaq? Is this the highest level of scholarship where they can found, give their own opinions on all matters directly from the Quran and Hadith? In Maliki Fiqh, when we recite um, prayers before or after the obligatory prayers, we recite a surah, Fatiha, and then a surah. But there's one exception the two rakas before Fajr, Fatiha only. These are meant to be very quick. Can I use zakat to pay for an iftar at my local mosque? No, you can't. Let me tell you something about zakat really quickly. There's there's a couple types of zakat. Two come up in Ramadan. Zakatul mal wa zakatul fitr. Zakatul mal is a zakat on your savings that you've had for one lunar year sitting there doing nothing. Okay? So that I look at my bank account today and may have, let's say I have $700,000 in my bank account. I go, and I did a lot of trading last year. The least from last Ramadan to this Ramadan, the least it had ever gone was down to 350, right? So that was the least. At any given time, through the whole last year, there was minimum 350. Beyond that, it went up and down as I did trade. I owe Zakat on 350. Even if there's um, $2 million in my bank account, but those two million haven't lasted for one lunar year. I just got them. Or they came in the last three months. But the one stable number that's been in the account for the whole year is 350K. I, I owe zakat on 350K. This is called zakatul mal. Zakatul fitr is something completely different. It's a very small amount that is uh, responsible to be paid or is liable to be paid for everybody who owns their daily bread. If you own food for the day you owe zakat al-fitr and zakat al-fitr is 10 bucks a person that's it and it goes to the people who are severely hungry and it goes in the form of food so we give our 10 um, let's say you're head of household and you have uh, three people in your household so you're paying 30 bucks pay it to the masjid that money is going to go we're going to go to Costco and we're going to buy olive oil honey raisins rice flour, sugar, stuff that's not going to rot. And we divide it up into baskets. And then a day or two before Ramadan's over, we'll be driving that around to the people's homes. So if you want to be part of that, let me know. So you can be part of that. It's always like an, a nice uh, day right before Eid. We're going out to the Costco, buying all this stuff, and then making it. The whole hallway of the masjid, we usually do it between Dohra and Asr. We have like four hours to do it. The whole hallway of the masjid is filled with stuff and it spills into the back room, into the main hall, amounts of stuff that really benefits people. So we're not talking about zakat al-fitr. We're talking about, that's called zakat al-fitr. The zakat of breaking your fast. You have to give it out before you, you break your fast on Eid. Before you pray Eid. Before the Eid prayer, you have to give it out. We're talking about zakat al-man. In the Shafi'i school and in the Maliki school, Zakat al-mal must be given out in the form of money. Okay? I cannot say I'm a, I'm a cell phone owner. Let's say I have a cell phone store. How much zakat do I have? I'm going to have to pay out $1,000 of zakat. All right, why don't I do this? The latest Apple phone is worth $500. I'll just give poor people two phones from my store, right? In the Maliki and Shafi school, we can't do this. Because what if the guy doesn't want a phone? 
right? He wants cash. And, he, and the, the guy owes zakah on that tijara too. He's doing tijara with funds. There is zakah on inventory too, which we have to cover. So, it, Hanafi school, however, they do allow that on some conditions. Condition number one, Zabe, you're Hanafi? Pay attention. <laughs> that was like a non-committed yes. <laughs> <laughs> number one, it must be something that is owned, that can be owned. So that means I owe $1,000 of zakah. Let me go find some poor people who owe me money and say, by the way, you know what? I'll pay, I'll, I'll pay your debts. You owe rent? I'll pay your rent. I'll, I'll give my zakat to the landlord. Can't do that. That's not something that can be owned. You have to give him something that he can own. You also cannot merely permit him to do something. Let's say I own a store. I can't come in now and say, I'll let you eat from my food $1,000 worth of food. No. He has to own the food. You can't let him eat. He, it must be something he can own. So the Hanafis do allow that. All right, so that's important. Now, what's the third? Now, when do we pay this? First of all, zakat al fitr is paid. Alhamdulillah, <coughs> has to be paid before Eid every Ramadan. Zakat al mal is paid the year, lunar year after you reach the nisab. The nisab is a certain amount of money. It's like uh, we did this yesterday. It's either six thousand or like seven hundred something bucks. Yeah, for gold it's six thousand. For silver it was like seven hundred and some change. Uh, the the nisab is different for people who used to interact with silver and gold. So, in front of the Euphrates River, Iraq, Arabia, Egypt, Syria, they used to operate in gold. Beyond the Euphrates River, they used to trade in silver. The main currency was silver. So, the amount in silver is far less than it is in gold. So, let's say you pass the nisab. You have to have that money in your account for the lunar year. You can be trading. You can own like $2 billion. But every year you trade so radically that you hit zero at some points. Because you trade radically like that. You'll never pay zakah. That's totally fine. Because you're moving the money. What, should, what The purpose of zakah is not to have money sitting there doing nothing outside the economy. So to discourage you from that, Allah says we're going to tax you. If you do that for 40 years, you lose all your money, right? If you do the math on that, it's not exactly 40 years because the zakah will be less and less and less every year. But over time, over one generation, you lose all that money. So to discourage people from just sitting on the money and hoarding it, Allah tax you with zakah. So as long as you're moving the money, there's no zakah. You're going under the threshold and gaining it back and going under and gaining it back at least once a year. So now you're going to pay that zakah. Most people can't remember when they pass the threshold. That's the truth. So we can pin our zakat al-mal on the month of Ramadan. We can pin it on Ramadan. People, some people say, I can't keep track of how much money I've had in my bank account. I just pay it on whatever it is I have in my account today. Uh, you don't really, it's not even that hard to find out. All you have to look is your bank statements. And see what was the lowest point that my account fell to. So if I have, as I gave the example earlier, if I have seven hundred thousand dollars now, but the at some point like two months ago it was at three fifty, why would you overpay when Allah didn't ask you to? Don't do this because your heart may shake a little bit when you cut that big check. You know that Allah, the the scholars say that when a businessman sits down at his desk with his calculator and all his assistants and his accountants to calculate his zakah. And he cuts a check for that, that that sitting right there is more blessed than if all of them were to spend the whole night reading the Quran at night and praying. That's more blessed. One, number one, that's fard. And number two, praying is nafl. Tahajjud is nafl. Number two, the one who prays all day and all night is not giving a dollar out of his pocket. Right? He's not losing anything. The guy, go and try now to write a check for $600,000. One time a brother came to me and he said, you can't believe what just happened. I wrote my first six-digit check. Right? 
And he didn't write it in zakat. He wrote it in a lawsuit that was against him that the judge had fined him to write that was oppressive. By every measure, it was wrong. By the sharia's measure, by common sense measure, it was wrong. But the judge fined him. You don't know what it feels like to write a check for six digits, right? Sign it and give it away. So this businessman is now doing it in submission to Allah from his own money. Now, remember, businessman, what's his job? To make money. A doctor says, my care is the patient. I don't care about the money. I care about the patient. When you're a businessman, your care is the money, right? So their heart becomes more attached to money. That's why uh, Abdurrahman al-Sumayt, who was a great uh, a da'iya and, and charitable giver in Africa, when his, his organization did studies and he said the businessmen are actually not the most generous. Because their business is money, they end up loving money. He said, the people who are in caretaking businesses, they're the most generous. Teachers, doctors, because their, their job is to care. So when you pull out those heartstrings, they respond. Secondly, on said on top of that, the, most, uh, the, the more generous is the woman over the men. So he said, we target female teachers and doctors. That's our donation target. We target them. Nurses, people who are females who are in a caregiving job, Right, that's who we care. And on top of that, a female is not responsible to take care of the house in Islam. Her money is one hundred percent disposable income. A man, his money is obligations to his family. He has to pay his rent. He's got to pay their education. He's got to pay for their health. He's got to pay for their clothes, their food, all that stuff. So a man does not have, except very little disposable income at the end of the month. So that's why men tend to not be as charitable. Okay. So you're going to, it's uh, as advice, pin your zakah due date to, let's say, the 20th of Ramadan. So in the last 10 days, you don't have to worry about it. If you pin it to the 20th of Ramadan, when Ramadan comes around, it's easy to remember, this is the month I got to calculate my zakah. You pay, you calculate your zakah, all of that div times or, or divided or 2.5%. Uh, so times 0 0.025, right? That's how you multiply 2.5%. That's how you get 2.5%. It is 1 out of 40. So you could also divide it by 40. Same thing. Just take all your zakatable income. Remember, subtract your debts. And this is a big discussion. Which debts? The Sharia in the Madiki school says, all of your debts, every single one. Hold on, Sheikh. I have a million dollars in my, of zakatable income. But I just bought... A eight hundred thousand dollar home, which I'm paying over the course of three months, uh, three year, thirty years. The Sharia, the Madiki school says, the whole eight hundred thousand is against you. It's a debt against you. Subtract it from your zakah. But the contemporary muftis held that the way we live today, we have so much debt. The couch has debt. People buy couch on payment plans now. A car, payment plan. TV. Payment plan. Everything in the house is on a payment plan. A frisbee. You buy <laughs> on TV, I remember they were doing like... They're selling frisbees on payment plans? $30, $5. Crazy. <laughs> they, everything is on a payment plan. If this was the case, I'd be a recipient of Zika, right? Yeah. And he's a millionaire. But uh, the contemporary mufti said, because no one would get Zika then, only subtract the coming bill. So I'm only on the hook, and this also makes sense, even though I have to pay the whole house, but I'm only on the hook for this monthly payment. When the state has taxes against you, like property tax, you count that against, that's a debt. The next water bill, the next phone bill, the next um, house payment, mortgage payment, the next car payment, the next insurance, all of your monthly salary, your, uh, your monthly uh, bills, Subtract it from your zakatable income and any private debts that you have. I owe somebody uh, privately, I owe someone money, you count that, the whole thing. Okay, because that's you, you pay it once, right? It's not paid by monthly. So, you, so it's zakatable income minus debts divided by 40. That's the equation of zakat. I actually have it in my book in Madik Fuck, I'm going to publish it soon. Zakatable income minus debts, draw a line. Put 40 underneath that. 
equals how much you pay in zakat. Where should you pay the zakat to locally? The local poor. The poor that you pray next to. It's no point in sending all your zakat overseas. The poor guy next to you never benefits from you, right? This is one of the reasons, wisdoms of zakat. You walk to the masjid every day and you're a guy who's all down and out and, and impoverished and, and, and um, coming in a rotten old Honda. But you pray next to a guy in the latest Tesla. When he gets bored with that, he'll get the next car. And him and his wife come in with a beautiful um, you know, SUVs and their kids are polished. And they go to private schools and you will pray next to them every day. Give me Hondas. something. Hondas? <laughs> uh, old Nissan. <laughs> old Toyota. My kids call those um, mosquitoes. Right? <laughs> the car is so beat up, it's like the mosquito on the road. But that poor guy prays Juma, parks his car every day, sees that other car, right? And prays Juma next to this guy. And this guy is always pulling out the latest phone, right? And he's always talking business. And you see the way they talk, the way they dress, who they hang out with. And we share space with you. We share a community center with you. We share a message with you. Hey, I'm not going to benefit from you, right? Allah says, yes, you're going to benefit from him. Don't have envy for him. Don't worry. You take a 40th of his savings is yours. So I feel great hanging out with these rich people now, right? Because <laughs> I'm going to, every Ramadan, I'm going to get some of their money for free. No work. Just the suffering. All my year, my year-long suffering earns me some of their money. Sharia removes the envy from the hearts of the people that way. My envy for the rich goes when I am taking a quarter, uh, one fortieth of his savings every year, right? And he's not giving it to me, by the way. He's not giving it to me. He doesn't deserve a thank you, okay? That's my money. In the Sharia, that money is not your money anymore. Allah has deemed it not your money. When you calculate that I owe $100,000 as a cat, that 100000 is not mine. If a poor person came in, and snatched it. Hey, it's my money. It's zakah. I'm poor. That poor person will be scolded by the government, by the sultan. He will be reprimanded for doing that. Okay? But he takes the money. So a poor person comes, and I have all my gold sitting here, and I'm calculating zakah. A poor person comes up, says, this is zakah? Yeah. He takes it and leaves. Right? We reprimand him. We scold him, we punish him maybe, a minor punishment, but he keeps the money because that's his money, right? If he was a valid recipient, the valid recipients are poor Muslims, the zakah distributors, the people who, whose job it is to distribute zakah, obviously it's a full-time job, he's got to work. The travelers, the army, the Muslim army, people in debt, let's say I'm not poor. I totally have a job, I have everything, but everything is fine. But I do owe $100,000 to medical school. That's a burden on my head. We can give you zakah. Even if you are driving a Jaguar right now and wearing a stethoscope. Okay? But you have a debt. That's a burden on your head. We pay that. Okay? But what would we pay? We'd pay the capital, not the interest. I mean, the, the, the original debt, not the interest. The principal, not the, the interest. The interest you pay and you, you and your sins. Right, we're not going to help you commit sins, right? But we will pay the principal for you, right? So we can pay for the one who has debt. Who else do we pay? The person on the brink of entering Islam. They're like fifty-fifty. They're always hanging out with us, but they're not yet Muslim. We can give them a nice gift. I think Shafi's got to be Muslim. Yeah, and Shafi think they have to be Muslim. Okay, so we said al fuqara wal masakin. What's the difference? One one of them is hand to mouth. Like he literally has no money at all. Any dollar you give him, he's going to go buy food. That's the extremely poor. What's the other type of uh, the faqir? The, 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 the faqir is someone he has, but it's never enough. And he lives off of jobs day to day, and he doesn't have a year's worth of security. For example, though, when you get a full-time job and you have a, like a contract, you feel that you have a year's worth of security, right? I can now rent an apartment, I could get a car, I have a, I have a full-time job. But these other types, they don't have a year's worth of security. He works on gigs here, job here, job there, and he just never has enough. He can take zakah for that. Okay? So those are the categories of zakah. 
ويسال الفقراء والمساكين والعاملين عليه والمؤلفة قلوبهم وفي الرقى اه oh, freeing slaves of course that doesn't exist today وفي الرقى والغارمين uh, وف وابن السبيل وابن السبيل the traveler وفي سبيل الله right the, the, the army the muslim army في سبيل الله means the muslim army doesn't mean any old islamic organization that you're doing for, for the sake of allah that's a mistake that many people make fi sabil allah means jihad fi sabil allah huh? what do they say no no like you can't give it to ikna <laughs> no no you can't just go and give it to a mosque or no uh f- or any organization that's you know doing good deeds no it has to be um the jihad now can you pay in the case of emergency to a abro- uh, some place abroad yes you can in the case of emergency like Gaza but it shouldn't be all of it remember you share a masjid you share a community you share a town with people who watch you be rich every day and watch you eat food and see your car that you drive in there's a little bit of something in their hearts whether no they could be the most pious people right but you should assume that the shit Allah knows best when he said give the zakah and the fuqaha really said this, right? Okay, I wonder what the proof is. You look it up? Yeah. The zakah should be given in your locality. Okay? So that those people that you share life with, their hearts, the envy has gone. And I witnessed this one time. I witnessed one time in Egypt, was walking with my uncle when I was young. A guy opens the back of a truck up. A truck. Like a, like a rental U-Haul or something. This truck it, it was filled with bags of meat. And all of a sudden, the poor people of the village, of the city, came running. And this guy, throwing bags of meat. Him and his workers, throwing bags of meat. Then, envelopes. Cash, 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 cash. It's probably the, the employee of a very rich man who has, he's given out Actually, this wasn't Ramadan, by the way. It wasn't Zakat al-Fitr. It was, this was Udhiyah. In the next Eid that's coming, we don't give out money, we give out meat. We slaughter and we give out meat. This was Eid al-Adha. So he was giving out. He was giving out that. Then he also gave out cash, right? Who knows, Sadaqa or Zakat or who knows what. But envelopes, envelopes to people. And then my uncle said, see, in Islam, this is what makes the poor never revolt against the rich. The poor love the rich, right? Because they take from the wealth of the rich. They benefit from the rich. And you could see in the eyes of the people, you could see the love. As they receive a couple bags of meat, an envelope or two, you could see how much they loved the person. And they said they were thanking them, like with all their heart. Who knows if they know which, which merchant that was or which, which wealthy person that was. They might not know. So that relationship... Is why Marxism never came out of the Islamic world. The, no Karl Marx ever came out of the Islamic world because of zakah. If we didn't pay zakah and we were just like any old people, the rich get richer and the poor get poorer, then yes, you would have one day had millions of people whose hearts filled with envy and hatred for you. One of those millions of people will be smart enough to be Karl Marx and to create a whole world and a whole system and a whole sense of justice that is solely based on envy for the rich. And hatred of the rich. Ryan is an evidence producing machine, folks. Firstly, what device is this? Okay. Nakli Zakati ila Ghairil Balad Alati Wujabat Wujibat fi or Wajabat fi or Wujibat fi. Wow. We're reading from Shafi Fiqh. It is not permitted. To transfer zakah from the country in which it is obligated. Okay. Talama and yujad mustahikuha. As long as there are zak- people who deserve that zakah in that country. Wa in al masafa. Even if it's a nearby city. Lianna fi dhalika ihashan wa ilaman li mustahikuha fi balidi wujubiha. Because this hurts the poor people in your city. It hurts the poor people of your city when you do that. Okay? You can give sadaqah to, 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 to other countries and other cities. إِذْ إِنَّ أَطْمَاعَهُمْ 
تمتدوا إليها because now they're they're they will be hurt and that will produce a type of bad feeling towards the rich now and they'll become greedy for that. وأمالهم تتعلق بها ولا ولقوله صلى الله here's the evidence. قوله صلى الله عليه وسلم to معاذ حين بعثه إلى اليمن فأعلمهم when when the prophet sent the companion معاذ to Yemen he said فأعلمهم أن الله افترض عليهم صدقة تؤخذ من أغنيائهم فترد على فقرائهم. He said, tell them that Allah has obligated zakat upon them, taken from their rich to be given to their poor. Okay? Amazing. Amazing. Uh, footnote. Is this footnote for this subject? No. Amazing. We need Hanafites to tell us what the ruling is for the Hanafites. Hmm. Uh, I remember Sheikh Farah Zaban mentioned a hadith where it said, uh, uh, "The sadaqah you first spend on yourself and the people around you, then more." So, how much uh, do you have to spend on yourself? For what? Uh, for like, uh, before you can give to others. Wait. Repeat the question. So uh, I remember uh, Sheikh Farah Zaban he mentioned a hadith. Where it said, uh, first spend on yourself, then your family members, and then the people around you, and then, uh, For what? General wealth, or what? <laughs> and then uh, he mentioned that, and then, so how much is uh, appropriate to spend on yourself? Mm. Uh, it's by orf, these things. Uh-huh. It's by orf, yeah. Yeah. It's by orf. What's the link for Syria, by the way? Did you put it up, by the way? This year, this Ramadan, we're going to be raising funds for the basement. Rendering the basement into an apartment. We're halfway there. We need to just finish it now. How much? Huh? How much, How much for loose? Yeah. A bunch. That's a bunch. I don't know if they gave me a set number, but it's a bunch of loose. 60K. If we can get 60K, that'll be amazing. It's nothing. 60K. Put a number up to Yeah. If we, if we can hit it to 50K, that'll be amazing. Yeah. Where's the link? Let's see. We need the link. You're gonna live in the basement, Habib? Hmm? You're gonna live in the basement? No, bro, I haven't been telling you since the water. <laughs> All right. After I saw that, I was out. <laughs> hey, Uga, read me questions from uh, from there. Um, yeah, this is Uga. That's Uga Painter right there. Yeah. <laughs> What is uh, oh. goat chipped? What does that mean? Guilt tripped. Guilt tripped. Okay. Hey, um, Zabe, I'm going to send you stuff right now. Yeah, no problem. He's been goat tripped, guilt tripped. Okay. Why is his family doing all this stuff to him? It, listen, if your family harms you, you're allowed to stay away from them. You're not cutting them off when you avoid harm. All right? If my brother every day, he comes and he attacks me. So I stop visiting him. Every time I come to his home, he attacks me. I stop visiting him. I'm not cutting him off. I'm avoiding harm. You as a Muslim are always allowed to avoid harm. All right? You have to understand that. You're always allowed to avoid harm. You're not cutting your family off. By avoiding harm. Comprende? 
Okay. You have Ahmed Ali on the cover of the su- on the donation thing. He's gonna get a lot of donation. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Zeb, yeah. I'm gonna send you a picture. And you're gonna put these pictures up, and we're gonna try to, you know, uh, etch out a little bit from this 50k that we want to get. Okay. What is, 60k, fine. 60k. A extra. Yeah, a little padding, no, no problem there. <laughs> Read me another question, Oog. Uh, Salam, are dice games like Monopoly Haram? Makru or Haram, depending on the schools of thought. Question, Game, yeah. Games of dice, games with dice, games of chance, card games. The ulama have said between it Makru or Haram. They either said discouraged or completely forbidden. Huh? Scrabble, scrabbles or Scrabble and dominoes. There's, I don't think it's games of chance because there is some intelligence being involved there. Like Scr- they like Scrabble so and dominoes. So like yeah, like dominoes, dominoes and Scrabble. I would say there's less of a game of chance there. Yeah. Like yeah. Put that picture up, <laughs> Zabe. <laughs> split the sp- split the screen. <laughs> put it up. <laughs> Look at that beautiful. Uh, picture there it says support the soup kitchen become self-sustaining Zabe's going to put it up right now we want it we need to be self-sustaining maybe you can uh, set up a walk this is a walk oh. yeah this is completely a walk like a shop that's a walk this is an apartments oh okay, okay, okay. The, we're building with this money with this flus we're building apartments that we're going to rent out to Tullab al ilm So it ends up benefiting Darfat and La Cusina too. Are there still tenants in the basement? No. The basement? You haven't seen the basement? No. Completely no. gutted out. No. And let me tell you the story behind it too. No. There's a story behind it too. So when we made the intention to do this, literally the week that we made the intention to make the basement a living space, it got flooded. Yeah. <laughs> and pipes burst. When those were you there? No, when you heard about. The story, I knew that was gonna yeah, the story. when the pipes burst, that forced us a to redo all the plumbing, which is good because if we had done that after finishing the basement, it'd be a disaster. But also, the ins- house insurance covered it. Ooh. Yeah, oh, really? it's covered it. So not only did we do the redo the plumbing, we did it better, Ooh. right? Very good. Click. You see this, folks? Now put the link in the chat, please. La Cocina 367 dash Safina Society. That's where we're gonna, you're gonna give us some help. Okay? That's where you're gonna give us some help. Yeah. We need this. All right? No, oh, sorry. Launchgood.com slash Safina Society. Sorry, re- rewrite that. You put it? Yeah. Okay, good. Launchgood. Okay. And we're at zero bucks, folks. We're at zero bucks. At least get us out of the zero. This is for the for this for the basement. Yeah, we're at zero. Get us out of zero at least. Isn't it smarter that we, instead of doing stuff and getting debts and then running to the people and saying, "Hey, we need money to pay bills," right? So your donation comes and just goes disappears. No. We're not spending. We're going to build the base, this, the, the, the walk first. We're going to build this endowment where people could support us through uh, building out the apartments. We then rent out the apartments and then we make our falus from there. Okay. So if we get out of the zero today, I'll be happy. So refresh it every two seconds, Zabe. There's a new uh, style of fundraising called buy a cup of coffee. What does la cocina mean? It means the kitchen in Espanol. What would the ruling be for student loans? Okay. There's, we don't have a solution for that. ACC is the best solution. A continuous charity. Which I told them you have to say a continuous charity. Because a continuous means it doesn't continue. A continuous. Yeah. 
We got 130, Allahu Akbar, from two different supporters. May Allah reward you all, right, for putting together, helping us put together this basement. You can't imagine, like, there's going to be, it's a great idea, right? You rent it out, and then once we get good at that, we'll keep doing it. How do you not emotion? How do you not emotionally distance yourself from a family member who identifies as Ligbiti Q and says you can't emotionally support them unless you're a pro Ligbiti Q? I don't emotionally support you. And I don't support your being uh, doing something disobeying God, right? Simple as that. Okay? I don't support this cause and you have you you don't just do the cause. You identify with the cause. You hold the cause to be your identity. So I can't support you or your cause at that point, right? It's not that you're struggling with it. You've embraced it. So you have intertwined yourself with the sin. So I can no longer support you nor your cause. Okay? And I am, I will be distanced from you because it's not something that you've fallen into. You have willingly done this. Okay? You have willingly done this. And you enjoy it and you want it and you've made it your identity. Okay? So I'll pray for your guidance. But don't expect me to hang out. Don't expect me to chill. Don't expect me to do all these wonderful things and smile and be fake. Don't expect me any of that stuff. Okay? But I will pray that Allah guides you back to the right path. That's what I would do. Okay? In that situation. And then let's go back to like the basics law or something. Why do you need any one support for any? Yeah. Maybe you shouldn't type that in the, in the footnote thing. LGB, right? Oh yeah, don't don't type that. You can put like alphabet soup. Sus. Is that still? Did they catch on to that too? <laughs> Here's another question. My mom asks, which one is better, to give a khutma to her mother, husband, brother, sister, and friend? Or to gift a single khutma to each of them separately. Oh, I think you mean khatma. It's like this. Uh, if you if you mean by that khatma, do you mean khatma of Quran? You do a khatma and make dua for all of them. Okay. If they passed away, right? If they've passed away, and you want to send them the reward of the khatma, then you'd give each one of them an individual one. How do you tell people to get ready to do Hajj spiritually and mentally? Which books on the history of Hajj, Men and Muzdalifa? So Ahmed Abid, the answer to your question is the physical preparations of Hajj is the best way to prepare spiritually because you're now going to mentally be feeling that you're, you're almost there and you're going. Second of all... Um, General Tawbah is the spiritual way to make increase your ibadah prepare yourself for hajj fast recite Quran do these things I want to point your attention to something do you guys uh, see that beautiful um, little thing that we added on the dot of the La Cucina oh yeah yeah in the negative space you know we itched out a crescent in the negative space you see that I saw the, the painting on the yeah Outside yeah. Right. Yeah. Nice painting. Who did that? That painting? A local art student from Rutgers, a Muslim student. Uh, yeah. Can dua change decree? One spouse wants divorce, the other doesn't. Any advice? Yes, dua can change this. Dua can change this. What's the ruling on giving zakat to family? Certain family members you cannot give zakat because you're obligated to take care of them. A man cannot give zakat to his wife or children. A woman or a man cannot give zakat to their parents. Because that's an obligation to take care of them. However, you can give zakat to your parents' debts. If your parents have a debt, you can pay zakat for that. In zakat, could traveler include a student wanting to study in another state? So would it be halal for them to take zakat loans from the madrasa? A traveler is someone who, who lives outside of his own land and he has needs for it. The key is that he has a need for it. 
So he doesn't have his dad's debit card or dad's credit card. At that point, he is not in need. But back in the day, the traveler was like estranged completely. And he was therefore in need. Even if he had tons of money at home, the reason that we can give him zakah is he cannot access his gold that's at home. Okay, you travel from Timbuktu to Cairo. All your money stays in Timbuktu, right? So it's as if you're poor in Cairo. That's why we're allowed to give charity to a traveler. Speak. Well, what about a trader? A merchant? Yeah. What about him? Like uh, they're carrying like uh, gold and trading from like Timbuktu to Cairo. Would they be still considered in that? Or no? If it's his, if he's trading from, from what is not his money, that's the key. If it's his money, uh, we have to look into what is the, con- the the qualifications of the traveler. I think it means the traveler who at this moment in time doesn't have his falus. His falus is all the way back in, at, in his homeland. Today, you carry your debit card. You can be in China, use the same debit card for Wells Fargo and get charged here. So I think it's a little bit different. But... Um, Evidence Saab is going to pull it up right now. <laughs> <laughs> Abu Hamdan says, find me an Egyptian wife. <laughs> Why isn't there clarity as to the names of the Prophet wasallam's sons and the number of his sons? So before Islam, I believe that's the only time where we don't have clarity. So when the Prophet wasallam had his first son and he died young, it wasn't a time where everyone was following every single little thing the Prophet did, right? So it is reasonable for there to be a misunderstanding about that. That Al-Qasim, was he at tahir and at tayyib were, were they the same person? Because you can imagine now, a baby could be, die, a baby could be born dead, a, baby could, a woman can miscarry, and it's easy for the society to lose track of the miscarriage from the death, right? So... And then when the when the Nubuwa came, I believe that you know nobody asked him about that after that, right? So Allah knows best, but uh, it's understandable. But after the Nubuwa, we know exactly who the children were. We know that there was Abdullah, and that's who they made fun of when he passed away. And Surah Al Kawthar was revealed. And then we know that Mari Al Qibtiya produced for the Prophet Sallallahu Ibrahim Alaihissalam, uh, uh, and he passed away. And you could say alayhi salam for Ahlul Bayt too. We're at 757. Well done. MashaAllah. 757 to cover this self-sustaining support uh, uh, apartment buildings in La Cocina. Yeah, keep scrolling down. Let's see. Because sometimes they leave us little cute comments. Right? Okay, MashaAllah. Look at all these beautiful people. All right, we have a, Thank you very much, folks. Jazakumullah khairan. All right. All right, scroll back up to it. Why is there a day limit? Now, nah, that's just something that uh, launch, good. launch good tells us. You have to set a limit. So you set a limit, then the we're gonna we're gonna reset the fifteen every time until we reach sixty. Oh. Yeah. But Tijara would be good. It would count. Ibn Sabil would count. Ibn Sabil, even if you're going for trade, it counts. Says Ryan Shafiq. As long as it's mubah. As long as the trade is a uh, permitted trade. Can I give zakat to my uncle, Neef, Nasi, cousin? Yes, all of them. All of them. You cannot just give zakat to your your wife. A man cannot give zakat to his children. And a man or woman cannot give zakat to their mom and dad. You can give zakat to a brother and sister, yes. But a man cannot give zakat to a sister if she's unmarried and it's his responsibility. Can you pray Aisha as part of Tarawih? Shafi fiqh allow, does not allow that, right? You have to have Can the same. Can you pray Aisha and Tarawi with the same niyat? No. Aisha? You pray Aisha behind someone praying Tarawi. Yeah. You could do that. So the Shafi's do not require the unification of intention. The Hanafis and Malikis do. They require the unification of the, the way the prayer looks, the, the building, how the prayer is. Like you couldn't pray Aisha behind a janazah. Ah, there's okay. no, there's no yeah. But you can pray a four behind a two. Yeah. Okay. And you can pray, for example, behind uh, Aisha, behind uh, Istisqa. Because there's two rukus. Istisqa. Oh, sorry, not Istisqa. Uh, kusuf. Because, no, no, you know, you kus, kusuf has two rukus. Yes, yeah, so you could. Yeah. So, uh, in the Shafi'i school, 
the intention of the imam and the ma'mum does not have to be unified. Okay? In Hanafi and Maliki schools, it has to be unified. I cannot pray Aisha behind someone praying Dhuhr. I cannot pray Aisha behind someone praying Tarawih. I can't pray Asr behind someone praying Dhuhr. Let's say I'm a traveler, right? And I didn't pray Dhuhr and the Imam is praying Asr. I can't pray my Dhuhr behind his Asr. In Hanafi and Maliki fiqh. But in Shafi'i fiqh, you can do that. Also, I uh, should mention, the Shafi'iya allow the follower to read along the, the Quran behind the Imam with a Mus'haf or a phone. doesn't matter, right? Phone, Mus'haf. Do you do that? I understand right? Okay. So I just listen. You see, so the Hanafis and Madikis don't allow that, but the Shafis anybody, allow that. I never saw any anybody do that in Tareem. Like I wasn't there for Tareem. Oh, uh, Tareem, they didn't do that? For Tareem, I wasn't there, but I don't know. It doesn't yeah. seem like it. people were doing that. You go to North Jersey, they all do that. Really? Yeah. They read along. The, everyone. So what's the point of that? Say, so read along and they sit for the Salah. Because you're allowed to sit for the Salah, you get half the reward. So he says a whole Tareem and then you. Feeling a, a moment of difficulty He sits on the chair Holds up the mushaf like this Right And right before the, he's finished He stands up Does rukwa Does sujood Does everything Then gets back up sit, Stands for fatiha Maybe a little bit of the few ayats As soon as he gets tired Sits on the chair again Right Follows along the mushaf While the imam's reading Yeah Shafi'iyah the, the, All this is valid for Shafi'iyah Yeah you saw someone doing that yesterday at NBIC? Yeah, someone was doing it next to me. Yeah. The guy activist is the sixth reason, I think. They said what? I asked him if we're done with the fifth, and then he said yes. Yeah. You got any emails too? Ask him if he got any emails. <laughs> Who are the movers and the prominent fuqaha of the Madiki school now? Um, definitely, we would say for sure, Sheikh Ahmed Al Maghidi of, of Algeria. Definitely for sure Sheikh Abdul Halim uh, Sheikh Abdul Halim of uh, uh, What's the last name? Mubarak uh, Al-Mubarak Sheikh Naif Al-Mubarak No doubt about that Right? Sheikh uh, The um, Mauritanian scholar in the Emirates uh, Huh? No, not Didu He's not a Maliki like really fully Maliki He's like sort of Salafi Maliki Hanbali Maliki uh, well, Haddamin Right Murabit Haddamin In in, uh, in the Emirates In Egypt uh, Sheikh Mahmoud Shabib is, uh, is a big scholar Of the Maliki school So in Tunis, Tunisia There are big scholars there. I don't know the names of some of the Tunisians but we can get the list. Problem is that what we need is each one of them to have a website, so he can publish his fatawa. Can a disabled person who is Hanafi perform tarawih with a few number of rakas by taking Maliki opinion for ease? Yes, or he can just become a Maliki totally. Can wife give zakat to the husband? I think it's makru. It's ha- it's valid zakat, but it's makru to give it to the husband um, because of the feeling that he may have. Catch feelings as some of these uh, youth say. Is that the right usage of it? No, no, catch feelings is when you're starting to be interested in somebody. Oh, catching yeah. feelings is when you love someone. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Sorry, I got my uh, little <laughs> local phrases wrong these days. Uh, Asma, can you give me that uh, Instagram comment? Sheikh Ibrahim Saleh of Nigeria, they're saying. Sheikh Ibrahim Saleh of Nigeria, Maliki scholar, mashallah. What's your opinion on Muslim marriage apps? Are they haram? I can't say it's haram to meet a woman on an app, but I can say that you, the app will only just be the starting point, and then you have to actually meet them in a in a in a wholesome way by meeting their family, etc. Wouldn't socialists and communists like the idea of zakah? It's still money being distributed to the poor. Socialists and communists would not like the zakah because it's not enough. They would want the whole 100% of the guy's money, right? 100% of the guy's factory, 100% of his farms to be distributed to, uh, to everybody else. All right, we got to run, unfortunately. So much stuff. Let's final number on our, 
uh, apartment. Seven fifty-seven. Good number, mashallah. Tomorrow will pass eight hundred, inshallah ta'ala. Okay. How does one know they're ready for marriage? If your deen and your character is sound, part of your deen is being able to uh, be a guardian over this this wife of yours. That means that you have to make sure that her expenses are covered. Is that not a fart upon you? So therefore it's part of the deen. If you can do that, if you have the capacity to do that, and you have the ability to be the imam of a small little unit, what else do you, uh, you need? Right? We got some people who are here ready for marriage. If you ask me, one, two, you're already married. You're not married? No. When is the muad to iftar? You guys are going by force. Islam, Islam was trying to fill me up yesterday. <laughs> my I was like, bro. Wait, why is Islam signing you up? I thought I already signed you up. <laughs> we need this brother on. Let's go to mbic.org. Okay, that's number one. Firstly, then go down to the uh, Ramadan calendar. Okay, because... All right, ladies at Tikaf, Friday night. Ladies at Tikaf. Mina youth at Tikaf, Saturday. Those youth at Tikaf? Oh, t tomorrow. What'd you say? Those youth at Tikaf are crazy. Oh, they're wild. We need you there, by the way. Uh, but it's all boys only, though. All right, prophetic <laughs> iftar. Only eating the foods of the Prophet minus the lamb. Okay. Mawadda iftar. Write it down. Sunday, March 17th. Habib, you're going. Oogs, you're going. Zabe, still too young. Okay. Con, what's that? He's going to marry the books. Convert and family iftar. That is... Monday, uh, Monday, March 18th. And then we have the Wild Nights, the Teen Girls Yatikef on Friday. Those are packed. But we're going to be gone. We're not allowed to be in the masjid that night. After the dhikr, we have to leave. Then Teen Boys Yatikef. That's when we need you there, cracking whips. <laughs> but teenagers are different, though. Teenagers are easy. I'll tell you the one that I truly enjoy. Tweens Yatikef. Grades seven and eight, six, seven, and eight. Those kids are like they still like like to have fun and you get some tears in there too. Yeah. It's exciting. Yep. The teens are too cool. They like the teens are too cool, yeah. on their phone. The like, teens, yeah, they're too cool. I, I don't like teens anymore. Anyway. Yeah. I like some teens, but not all of them. Like there's like too cool and I, why are you even here? Could you go and <laughs> scroll on your Instagram somewhere else? TikTok. Fellowship iftar is for the greater community. Suhba iftar is for young professionals. Okay. We're okay. Also trying to get married. Huh? Muslim. It's like kind of Mawadda too, right? Yeah. Like if someone's trying to get married, you can. Yeah. ISIS is almost more successful than Mawadda because the Sahaba Iftar, you can be married already. So 50% are already married. And they help you. And they help you. Yeah. yeah. And they're also young professionals, so everyone's ready. They have a job already. Yeah. Young professional. Theoretically. Yeah. All right, ladies and gentlemen, we got to stop here. جزاكم الله خيرا سبحانك اللهم وبحمدك نشهد أن لا إله إلا أنت نستغفرك ونتوب إليك والعصر إن الإنسان لفي خسر إلا الذين آمنوا وعملوا الصالحات وتواصوا بالحق وتواصوا بالصبر والسلام عليكم ورحمة الله